And I make a joke. I make a joke because it's something that makes me uncomfortable, something that troubles me. And there's, a, there's always been comedians doing this. Like, comedians always talk about what's uncomfortable with them. And in fact, like, Joan Rivers, Joan Rivers, a very brilliant comedian who passed away, she used to talk about all sorts of things. Like, her husband committed suicide. A few days later, she was doing jokes about it. Right? She did jokes about the Holocaust. People got angry with her, yelled at her, and she was like, look, it's this horrible thing. This is how I cope with something that horrible. I make fun of it. Now, I bring it up. Because it's easy when someone does something criminal, right? When someone does something criminal, there's no questions asked. We all agree. No one is defending Rolf Harris, right? No one is defending Bill Cosby because we all agree what they did was wrong. When they get blacklisted, when they get deplatformed, everyone's like, yes, that makes sense. But a lot of people in the last two years of my 47, not all of them have got in trouble for stuff which they've done. Some of them have got in trouble for stuff which they've said for uncomfortable jokes they've made. That has been like, like Joe, Joe Brand. Joe Brand's on the list, right? Joe Brand told a joke. Joe Brand told a joke about throwing acid in the faces of people like Nigel Farage. People got very angry, very angry. And it's not like she's in prison, but you've probably not heard her on the radio recently, right? It had a tangible effect, right? Also, lots of white people have lost their jobs for being racist on social media. I'm looking around the room, there are quite a lot of white people. <laughs> you are all in danger. You're in danger. You don't even realize you're in danger. You could enjoy the show. You could enjoy the show, right? Chelsea, you could love the show. After the show, you could go home and tweet how much you like the show. You used the wrong GIF image to represent me. <laughs> Monday, no more programming for you. Some of these people say they were accidentally racist. Oh my God. I worry for you people. And I've realized you've paid money to give money to my show. So I'm going to give something back. I've come up with a few tips, a few tips for white people <laughs> for how not to lose your jobs for being racist on social media, okay? <laughs> Few simple tips. Now look, the brown people in the room, do what you like, you're fine. <laughs> Tweet what you like, you're totally fine. You, you, you're like, like, like are you a mixed race? Uh, so you're, you're fine, tweet what you like. <laughs> Half of you can tweet what you like. The other side, be careful. Be careful. Just half of you. I mean, just half. 50-50. Like, you can just be half offensive. Okay, okay. Right? No, no. But honestly, you need to think about it. So I've come up with helpful tips for the white people in the room for not losing your job when tweeting about brown people on social media. Tip number one. Very easy one. Stay away from the zoo. Yeah. Don't mention giraffes or lions. Also, no, no animation references. No Hakuna Matata or something like that. <laughs> For the love of God, just, just stay away from the zoo. It's a bank holiday. The zoo is closed. Closed! <laughs> Tip number two, if you're white and you come across a post about something like the music of Black Origin Awards, right? Or, or something like, you know, Black History Month. And you find yourself thinking like, wait, 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 wait a second. Why do they get their own month? They get a month. I don't have a month. There was white history too. When's my month? Just remember all the other months are yours. <laughs> All of them, you've got them covered. Like, like especially December, there's snow, <laughs> there's eggnog. It's all white stuff, man. It, it's, it's white. Why do you think they call it a white Christmas? It's yours, like 100%. Kissing under bushes, that's white. That's all white stuff. Whitest holiday ever. <laughs> and then the final one, I, I, I didn't even know. Actually, no, no, that's what am I saying? There are two more, there are two more, there are two more. Okay, so the, this one is a new one. This is a new one. I, I, this is the first time I, 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 I had to add this because of, of the BBC. Uh, now, look, if you are working for the BBC, right, and you, you, you know, you have to put together a video about a uh, celebrity who has passed away, who has happens to be black, Google them. <laughs> okay, now the reason I'm making this, 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 this additional thing is, 
Do, are you aware of this? So two weeks ago, very tragically, Kobe Bryant passed away, right? And uh, when the BBC did their little, um, you know, their little memorial of him, they used the image of another black basketball player who looks nothing like, yes! Someone said no with disability, yes! But then to compound it, they apologize. Look, it's, it's a mistake. I'm not saying no one makes a mistake. We can't go straight to racism. Maybe it was an innocent mistake. But then, a few days later, there are two black MPs who look nothing alike. They posted a picture of one with an image of the other one. <laughs> Just Google, Google. You're on your computer anyway, Google. <laughs> what does Kobe look like? Also, what Kobe, they were probably like, 500 other memorials. Just go to CNN and steal that image. <laughs> but look, I, 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 I'm saying this here, actually, I was called. I was called by the radio, and they asked me to come on and talk about it. I said, hell no, because I work for the BBC. I've got a show on the BBC, the citizen of nowhere. I, I don't want to lose it. And then also, part of me just kind of hopes that the person who made these mistakes, mistaking black people for each other, I hope that's also the person who assigns pay packets. Because <laughs> I would love them to accidentally send me Lenny Henry salary. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And then we've got another one. We've got another one. We've got a, the, the final one. The final one uh, uh, was inspired. Do we have any Canadians in the room? No, this was inspired. I didn't have it at the beginning of the tour. But again, number 38 on my list of now 49 was uh, Pierre Trudeau. Uh, the, no, sorry, Justin Trudeau. Shit, I've, com I've, co I've confused the Trudeaus. Well, they're their family, so it's understand. It's understand. <laughs> now I'm confused. Which one was it? It was Justin, right? Yeah. It was Justin. Pierre was his dad. Right, okay, okay. So uh, essentially, Prime Minister of Canada, Prime Minister of Canada got in trouble and made me realize I had to add Tip number four, if you're white and you have to go to a Christmas or like a, a Halloween or just any costume party and you find yourself thinking, I need a costume, what can I wear? What can I wear? Ah, ah, and then you realize, you know what I could do? I could just paint my face. <laughs> you can paint your face, it's a free country. We're not gonna, we're gonna stop you from using paint, but for the love of God, go pastel. <laughs> Bright orange, you're fine. Blue, you can't offend a Smurf. <laughs> but I'm not angry, right? When I bring up these jokes, sometimes people say, you know people these days are so angry, huh? People are such snowflakes. People get so angry, you can't say anything. You know, people are so angry. I don't actually know anybody who gets angry by this stuff. What actually happens is you read about it, you look at them, and you say, twat, right? <laughs> you're not actually angry. They really like, oh, people are so sensitive. No one's sensitive. They're just thinking you're a twat, right? <laughs> and then more than that, I don't get angry. I get amused, not at what they post, but at their defenses. Do you remember what happened with Danny Baker? OK, if you don't remember this, essentially last year, Danny Baker, BBC broadcaster, right, BBC broadcaster, Royal baby was born. Meghan Markle has a, a child. The child is mixed race. He represents this child on Twitter with the image of a chimpanzee. He did not listen to Deliso's rule number one. <laughs> Stay away from the zoo. <laughs> now there's a lot of debate. There were people defending it, saying, oh, it's just harmless. It's just a picture of a chimpanzee. It's just cute, it's a cute chimpanzee. And then there are other people saying, but look, historically, Black people have had to deal with people yelling monkey sounds at them. This is totally unacceptable. People arguing he lost his job. Now, I don't think he had to lose his job because other people have done worse than he did, kept their jobs. Anne-Marie Morris said the N-word in Parliament, kept her job. The difference is she apologized properly. Danny Baker's apology began, you guys are sick in the head <laughs> to think that I meant anything negative. But if that's what you think, and you're offended, I'm sorry. And I was like, that's not an apology. <laughs> you have got to apologize if you get in trouble on social media. You've got to apologize the same way you would apologize to your wife. Could you imagine 
beginning an apology to your wife with, you are sick in the head. <laughs> but if you really think it's insensitive that I forgot your birthday, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not gonna work, is it? <coughs> she will cut something off. <laughs> And the other thing he said is like, look, man, I couldn't have meant anything. I couldn't have meant anything. There's not a racist bone in my body. Right? This is the same defense we just said. There's, there's a bit of a broadcast. What am I saying? We had 50, not 49. Did you see this broadcast a few days ago who, who made some comment about angry black lads and stuff like that? Well, anyway, uh, anyway, I didn't write a joke about it because I didn't know who he was. But either way, the, his defense was, hey, there's not a racist bone in my body. And whenever I read this, I'm like, dudes, that's not how racism works. It's not in the bones. I've never heard of a surgeon looking at an x-ray and going, whoa, 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 whoa. I need a second opinion on this. His elbow clearly hates Pakistanis, man. <laughs> it's not in the bones. And, and, and people want it to be simple, don't they? They're like, they want it to be, oh, there are people who are racist and there are people who are not racist. Because people are always saying, I'm not a racist. In fact, my American friend, your president's always saying, I'm not a racist. I'm not a racist, I'm not a racist. No, I'll tell you the truth, I believe him. Because I don't know if I've ever met a racist. No one is racist all the time. No one has horns, wakes up in the morning, eats their porridge in a racist way. <laughs> Why are there black spots here? <laughs> Walks down the street, kicks a black person, spits on a white person, and then no one is like that. It's not. Realistic, we're complicated people. We have contradictions, right? I know one person thought he wasn't racist at all because he was a white person whose best friend was a black person. But at the same time, when his daughter brought home a black person who she was interested in, he lost his mind, right? So you can have these contradictions. You can be someone who's all for equal rights but maybe your sense of humor is kind of racist. We can have, I have contradictions. I do, I'll admit, I, I, I like to think of myself as someone who's pro-feminism, right? Someone who's all for equal rights, equal pay for women, but at the same time, if you took a long, hard look at my internet search history, <laughs> there are a few websites I don't think I could defend. <laughs> We're complicated people. <laughs> also, we don't all react to things the exact same way. We don't, because people always think we have the same reaction. My reaction to Liam Neeson might even surprise you. Do you remember when Liam Neeson got in trouble? Oh yes, number 33. <laughs> okay, so Liam Neeson, if you don't remember last year, just decided to tell us. Nobody asked him, but he decided to tell us that 40 years ago, a friend of his was assaulted by a black person. He was full of rage, so he grabbed like a a big metal kosh, like a big stick, started walking the streets of Ireland looking for a black person, any black person, to kill. And this maybe should have horrified me, but I was reading it like, Liam Neeson walking the streets of Ireland to kill a black person? I would watch that movie. Because <laughs> I don't think I care. I, I don't care. Number one, it was 40 years ago. Also, it was a fantasy. Who knows what would have happened if he actually met a black person? Because he could have been prowling the streets saying, I'm gonna kill a black man, I'm gonna kill a black, oh, this fuck is pretty big, okay. <laughs> I'll keep looking, I'll keep looking. <laughs> Maybe I'll run into Webster, okay, okay. <laughs> oh. Also, he regrets it, he regrets it, right? But the interesting thing is, even if he didn't regret it, even if he had racist thoughts now, I don't know if I'll care. He's an actor, he pretends to be someone else. I don't care what's going on in his head. Some people care. I have a friend who used to love Morrissey's music. Morrissey started saying some pretty naughty things. She can't listen to his music anymore, right? I'm not sure about that because I'm like, well, part of my viewpoint though, I think was changed because of a friend of mine. Now I had a friend called Greg, a comedian, not super famous, so you wouldn't necessarily know him. But either way, he passed away, but the last two years of his life, he wasn't really a comedian. Because it came out that he was a big member of the EDL, the English Defense League. Now, do we all know what the English Defense League is? Yeah. Yeah. Clap your hands if you don't know them. Jordan, you don't know them. Okay, Jordan, um, 
So are you visiting the UK? No, I'm studying. You're studying here. Okay, so the English Defense League, essentially, well, how do we summarize them? They, they're just a political group who hate people like, they hate brown people. They, you don't need to know them. They wouldn't like you. They'd lose their mind. In fact, yeah, they'll lose their mind. They, they hate people who are Muslim. They hate people who are brown. They hate immigrants generally. You're enemy number one, right? So if you ever see someone with an EDL side, just run, run, <laughs> run. What are you studying? Engineering. Oh, okay, excellent. Well, you, you all, this room is full of people my parents wanted. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. So, so, so essentially, this friend of mine, this comedian, he was a member of the English Defense League. His social media was full of xenophobic sort of statements. People screenshotted them, sent them to comedy clubs. No one would hire him. And I always felt a bit weird about this. Because on the one hand, I disagreed with him about everything. We would have passionate arguments. When we were driving to gigs, I'd be yelling at him, you ignorant bastard, and he'd be telling me, oh, you are naive. They're going to take over. Oh, he was all into these conspiracy theories. Oh, they're going to bring Sharia law to the UK, and we'd go on all these crazy rants, right? But either way, we'd argue, we'd get to the gig, we'd have a drink, perform, and that would be that. And on stage, he never brought up politics. He just told knob gags. So I always thought it was a little bit weird that he wasn't allowed to perform for stuff he said off stage, even though I disagreed with it. What do you think? Do you think people should still have a platform, still be able to perform, or still be able to have a job if they're, they're, they're racist? Clap your hands. Oh, I, I, I've, oh, look, I've made it a bit too broad. I think I've made it a bit too broad. Actually, let's make it more specific. Clap your hands if you run a business. Clap. OK, OK, I'll start with the business over here. Hello, Matt. Uh, hello, what's your, your business? Yes, Barbara? Yeah, I run a hotel. You run a hotel. OK, OK, OK. So let's say at your hotel. Is this a, a Brighton hotel? OK, so your Brighton hotel, you're running this hotel, and you need a new concierge, right? And a fellow shows up for his interview, right? You know, you've got a dress to impress, and he's wearing a KKK costume, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. And he's like, sorry, I was just in a meeting. Uh, he takes it off. He says, OK, OK, OK. And then he comes out in a nice suit. But you now know he is a. When he's not working, you know he's a KKK enthusiast, right? He wasn't at a, a now would you hire said person if everything else on his resume was amazing? No, you wouldn't, no you wouldn't. Okay, excellent, excellent. Any other businesses in the house, clap. Okay, what's your business? I like how between the first question and now, <laughs> there's been a recession in Brighton. <laughs> And all the businesses have shut down. I'm like, I didn't know I was going to answer that question. OK, so brave lady, brave lady, what is, what is your business? In housekeeping. So is it you who do it, or do you supply housekeepers to places? You do it, and you used to also hire other people. So when you were hiring other people, if someone came in and you know this person is like amazing with a mop and vacuum, they're the fastest cleaner everywhere, but part of the reason that they're such a good cleaner is because they hate brown things, right? They, they, just, it's like they want everything to be white. Every floor must be white. They're very good at making things white, but they also hate brown people. Would you hire this person? What? She said no. She said no. How interesting. Actually, it's it tells me where in the world I am, because I've been doing this question all over the UK, and Brighton's the first place I've got no, no, no. <laughs> right, 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 which is good, which speaks well for you. And I think it's complicated, though, because oddly, I'm somewhere in the middle. Right, because part of me, I, I like that. Like, you know, I book opening acts. Well, not on this tour, right? <laughs> like, any of you who saw my previous tour know I had an opening act. I did 80 dates with them. At the end of the tour, I had to give them 16,000 pounds. So I said, next year, I'm going alone. <laughs> but let's say I have a bigger budget and I'm booking an opening act. And uh, you know, if, if they were racist, I would hesitate, right? But then I started thinking about it. And I was like, if every person in the country who is racist, and they're quite a lot, was unemployed, bam! There's a point, right? When we're like, who else, who else is the problem? Right? Homophobic people, bam! Right? People, just people with horrible views. Let's, let's, let's make, there's a point where society is going to collapse. So I actually think the most I can hope for, and I think a lot of us are like this, is I just hope that certain important jobs, pillar of the community jobs, which matter too much, shouldn't be occupied by racists, right? Like clap your hands, teachers, teachers, clap. <laughs> yes, like teachers, you were all too important. <laughs> you had better not be racist, sir. No, 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 I like 
how you like, I'm not racist, and you put your hand around her as if to, to say that proof. She's white too! <laughs> no, but you're not racist. This is good. You, it's good. Teachers are too important. You don't want a racist teacher. Also, you don't want a racist in government. <laughs> but there are other jobs. Other jobs, I don't, ca I don't care if my plumber is racist. All I care for when paying for plumbing is the price. <laughs> if on the one hand we had a guy who's Gandhi meets Mandela, beautiful soul, and he's charging me 200 quid, and a racist bastard is charging 80 quid, I'm paying 80 quid. <laughs> he could even be swearing at me while fixing my pipes. <laughs> he could be like, yeah, black bastard, go back to Africa. I'll be like, I'm going back to Africa with 120 quid. <laughs> <laughs> and I think this is also with age, because I'll admit, when I was younger, I used to be full of passion. I would say, no, I would never work with the racist, screw these guys, and I used to try to persuade people. If I was online and I saw someone post something intolerant, I would spend two hours trying to logic away their hate. And now I'm older, I just don't have that passion. Oh, oh, I used to protest in university. Clap your hands, people who've been to a protest in the last year. Oh, I admire your passion, I admire your passion. I used to protest all the time in university. Last year, I got ready to go to a climate change protest in Manchester. I woke up in the morning, it was cold. I said, ah, fuck it. <laughs> I'll go when the climate changes, I'm sorry. Oh. I just don't have that youthful passion, right? And then, oh, it, it's not that my views have changed, I just, I wish I did too, because now I've got the responsibility, because now I've got a platform and I'm on the list. There's a list, which you might not know about, of D-list and E-list black celebrities who get called every time something race-related happens. This is why I got the call when the BBC misidentified Kobe, because I'm on the list. And you're gonna notice it now, every time. Next time someone does something, just wait, next morning, all the morning shows have one random black person. <laughs> and when they first called me, I was like, why are they calling me? I've not written a book on race, right? I've not got a PhD in social you know, studies or something like that. No, why me? And I figured it out. They're probably there thinking, we need to talk about this. Oh no, all our anchors are white. We need to bring in somebody black. And one of them's like, let's get Idris Elba. We can't get Idris Elba. What are you talking about? Idris Elba has got stuff to do. <laughs> Who can we actually get? And then one of them's like, you know what would make a very stimulating discussion? Why don't we get that MP who's always talking about race? This is right in his wheelhouse. Let's get that MP, David Lammy. No, 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 he's way too angry. We need a happy one. <laughs> but they don't ask you, hey, why don't you come in? and talk about race, because of course you'd say no. No, 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 no. So what they say is, hey, you're on tour. Why don't you come in studio, talk about your tour? They got me during the World Cup, oh, they got me. Because do you remember when Lord Sugar did this tweet about the Senegalese football team? If any of you don't know this, Lord Sugar got in trouble, he did a tweet, it was a Senegalese football team superimposed with slippers and watches, and he wrote a tweet saying, I think I recognize these guys from a beach in Marbella, right? It was a silly gag based on the premise that black people all look alike. I get called to come on Good Morning Britain to promote my tour. And I should have known something was fishy when I looked at the other guests. Because it was Pamela Anderson, Danny Dyer, and Jeremy Corbyn. What the hell was I doing on that lineup? And like an idiot, I walk in going, I think I'm famous now. I think I'm famous now. I sit down, my tour does not come up. Pierce Morgan looks straight at me and says, did you think that Lord Sugar's tweet was racist? I said, no, and they moved on. <laughs> that was my whole contribution. And when I look back, I realize they, didn't, they, they just assumed that it would be good television because I'm African. Clearly, I'll be offended, and I can have a good on-TV battle with Pierce Morgan, right? But they didn't check my viewpoint, so I was just like, man, I was actually a worse person to bring on. They would have been better off finding, like, a super liberal white person
to argue with him, because I'm a comedian. I write more offensive jokes than that before breakfast. <laughs> How do they think I am going to be offended with that? Like, it's like watching a horror movie with a surgeon and saying, do you think there's too much blood in this thing? <laughs> I am totally desensitized to offensiveness. And I went home and I got all kinds of abuse. Now, anytime I do TV, I expect abuse, right? Like, uh, you know, when I did Brilliance Got Talent, I made a joke saying that, you know, the crowd was very white. 200 years ago, this would have been an auction, right? <laughs> Great gag! You have no idea the amount of abuse I got over the next year. Like, just my inbox was full almost every day as new people discovered, saying, oh, you're black, always oh, banging on about slavery. If you don't like the slavery, go back to Africa, monkey man. And I was reading this like, this guy does not know how slavery worked. <laughs> it was not a go back to Africa thing. It was more import than export. <laughs> also, dude, stay away from the zoo. <laughs> but I expected. Also, I, I, I did The Apprentice. You're fired, like a little show, show a few weeks. I got all kinds of, oh, you only got the job because you're black, huh? Oh, all these people swearing at me, calling me the N-word, all sorts of stuff like that. Now, a lot of people think this must depress me. It doesn't. I kind of like it. Honestly, it amuses me. Because when I open these inboxes and I look at their angry faces, I'm like, wow, if I'm pissing you off, I must be doing something right. <laughs> Doesn't bother me at all. But when I went on Good Morning Britain and I said that Lord Sugar's tweet about the Senegalese team didn't offend me, I got abuse from a very unexpected place. Other black people, woke, angry black people, started messing me. Oh, guess who's in the pocket of the white man? What kind of coonery is this, your Uncle Tom? Huh? How much money did they give you to sell your soul? And I was like, I didn't know money was available. <laughs> Who do I invoice? <laughs> I made fun of it, but it was kind of depressing while it was happening because there were people who were my diehard fans saying, you know, I used to love your comedy, but now that you said this, I'm never going to watch it again. And I was like, wait, wait, we disagree on one thing? I don't find it offensive, you find it offensive, that's it? You're not going to watch me again? And then there were other people who tried to start like a little movement. Hashtag cancel Denise Ochoponda, right? Now you are aware of this term, cancel whoever. Right? If you're not aware of this, this happens a lot more now and that. Essentially, when something comes out about something, or you, you find out uh, years ago, uh, you know, Kevin Hart did jokes about uh, uh, homophobic jokes. So you find out that an author like Ernest Hemingway Right, being taught in school curriculums, and then it comes out that he actually wrote racist stuff in his diaries, right? Then there's a big sort of hashtag cancel Kevin Hart, hashtag cancel Ernest Hemingway. And what that means practically is if it's a writer, they like stop teaching their books on school curriculums. Get rid of their books, take them out of libraries, take them off Amazon, get rid of them. If it's a musician, they like get rid of his music, burn his music, destroy his music. And I kind of understand but at the same time, I don't know how practical it is. Because you can do it very easily with a musician, a comedian. If you wanted to cancel me, it's easy. Get rid of all my stuff. But what are we going to do when it turns out that an architect was racist? <laughs> are we going to just start bulldozing buildings? Or what if Galileo was a nonce? <laughs> Will we be like, sorry, kids, the world's flat. Understand the impulse, because wouldn't it be a wonderful, better world if everybody talented was a good, humane, understanding person and everybody untalented was a hor horrible human being? Wouldn't that be great? But it's not like that. People are complicated. But I also feel like the UK is kind of a privileged place to be, right? Because you've got nutters. You've got these nutters in the UK. Right? You definitely do. You've got pockets of nutters who send me the abuse. But I've lived in nine different countries. right? And by far, the UK is the most accepting place I've ever lived. Yeah, because of course you've got your nutters. But overall, if I was going to generalize, most of you could not care less. <laughs> in fact, I'll go a step further and say most of you hate each other more than foreigners. <laughs> yeah. Streets of Manchester, someone yelled at me, hey, you're black, at least you're not from Liverpool. <laughs> you hate each other. 
But of course you've got your pockets, you've got your Katie Hopkins types, you've got a, a lot of these pockets. But even when they say nutty stuff at me, I don't let it bother me because I'm an adult now. When I was a kid, it hurt. But now I'm older and I've realized, you know, even the racial slurs are lazy. <laughs> they just describe what they see. Think about all the insults, right? Oh, he's darker than me, I'm gonna get him darky. It's like a three-year-old came up with it. All of them, even the worst one, the N-word comes from negro, which means black. Which means once upon a time a racist saw someone black and said, black. <laughs> and I know this for certain because I was actually there at ground zero at the birth of a new racial slur. I was walking down the streets of Newcastle. Oh, this is the last joke of this half, so just wait one moment. <laughs> no, but if you gotta go, you gotta go. Uh, <laughs> If I made you laugh till you pissed yourself, that would be quite, quite, quite an achievement. Okay, so this is the last joke, so don't worry. Don't worry, people are antsy. This was actually a longer first half than usual because you were very chatty and you brought up people I didn't know, which is lovely. It's about the show is growing. Okay, so I was there on day one of a new racial slur forming, and this is when I realized they just describe what they see because I was in Newcastle walking with a white woman. I do that sometimes. <laughs> There was an angry, drunk racist, saw us walking together, got upset by what he perceived as interracial action. He wanted to yell out abuse, but the poor guy, there's no insult for a black person and a white person walking hand in hand. He had to make one up. And he panicked, he was drunk, he just went with what he said, uh, uh, something black, something white, and he just started to yell, uh, penguin! <laughs> penguin! I was confused, how could I be offended by penguin? I love happy feet. I almost wanted to help him out, right? Because there are other things that are black and white. He could have pointed and said, hey, old television, chessboard, polka dot, that song by Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson. Ha, ha, ha.